Hello and welcome. I'm Ray Upchurch, and you're watching the Trey Hart Learning Channel. So, today I'm going to finish our discussion on medications used in heart failure. Okay, let's start with a little bit of legal stuff. First off, I am a nurse. And any information in this or any previous videos is not intended to diagnose or to treat patients. That is what your doctor's for. I am only human, so any mistakes are unintentional, and I disclaim any legal liability. And lastly, I am not affiliated with any drug company, and definitely am not being paid by any drug company for my comments. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so now that that's over, let's get on with the good stuff. As we've be learned before, some of the medications that a person with heart failure uses are not necessarily used to improve the heart, are, are not used to improve heart failure but are sometimes medications that prevent things like strokes or other heart attacks, or medications that might help uh, control arrhythmias, or that restore minerals that we need. So, let's start with Jajoxin. <laughs> My cat wants to get in on this. <laughs> so, Jajoxin is a medication that has some arrhythmic properties, meaning it will help you control your heart rhythm. It will help control the rhythm of the heart even by slowing it down and strengthening the heartbeat, which allows more blood to be pumped in an efficient manner. Like all medications, digoxin has side effects, which may include rash, confusion, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea or constipation, enlarged breast and men's, a slow or irregular heartbeat, and may cause dizziness and lightheadedness. So, usually when you start to develop the effects from the digoxin, it's usually because the blood levels of digoxin are so high, uh, are high, excuse me, so the doctor will usually just lower the dose or temporarily stop your digoxin if you're already on a lower dose. So what main side, you know, the, the main side effects that you should tell your doctor about is nausea, disturbed vision, or poor appetite. Um, especially if mainly if the poor appetite is a new symptom. If you have poor appetite before it, then it's not new. Um, because digoxin levels are, um, are considered therapeutic, and levels, there are some levels that are therapeutic, um, there are levels that are too high, and the high levels will lead to these side effects, the doctor will do regular blood checks. So these blood checks are usually done every six are done six hours after the dose. So you're going to need to plan your day or plan your schedule so that you can be to the doctors and have your blood check done six hours after the dose in which he's requesting it done. Usually, if you already have a slow heart rate, the doctor will not prescribe dejection, which is especially true if you have any type of heart block. And lastly, do not take antacids or fiber supplements within two hours of taking your digoxin, as both of these affect the absorption of digoxin. Okay, so next, let's talk about the class of medications sometimes referred to as antiplatelets, mainly aspirin and clopidogrel. Now these two typically aren't used together and clopidogrel is only usually prescribed temporarily from six months to a year 
after you've had a heart attack. While aspirin, when it's, used, when it's prescribed, is usually prescribed for the rest of your life. So, what some doctors do is that when you're taking clopidogrel, they will temporarily stop the aspirin until the clopidogrel is stopped. And then they will resume your aspirin. Now, both of these medications reduce the risk of clots um, forming by making it less sticky, which reduces the risk of having a heart attack or a stroke. So, both of these have the same side effects, which can include, you know, nausea, vomiting, indigestion. However, aspirin may make some heart failure symptoms worse, especially if you have very severe heart failure. So some of the side effects associated with aspirin can be less if you prescribe the enteric coated aspirin. Basically, you'll have less stomach problems associated with it if it's enteric coated. Now, one of the things you need to let your doctor know is if you have any skin rashes develop, any signs of stomach bleeding, and immediately call for help should you develop difficulty breathing, swelling to your face, eyelids, or an asthma attack. <clears throat> Lastly, try to take your antiplatelets such as aspirin and clopidogrel with food. And know that some anti-inflammatory medications may cause your aspirin to be less effective. And as well, aspirin might not be suitable if you have as asthma. So let's also talk about statins and fibrates, also known as cholesterol-lowering drugs. Statins include arterovastatin, fluvastatin, provastatin, rosuvastatin, and simvastatins. The fibrates include bezofibrate and clofibrate. Now, both of these medications lower the cholesterol in your blood, which can reduce the risk of strokes and heart attacks. When you have less cholesterol, you have less chances of your arteries clotting. But the main side effects include stomach upset, diarrhea, constipation, and rarely muscle cramps and weakness. Now statins may have a, a other side effect which is forgetfulness, but this is usually a temporary thing. So if you have any unusual pains in your stomach to include cramps or any weaknesses, or, or this is one thing that you should notify your doctor about. So, while statins and fibrates do not require any blood checks, your doctor will usually perform a blood check on your cholesterol three months after starting the statins. And then once a year. They just basically want to make sure that your cholesterol is going the right way. Now, statins are usually taken at night and it's best to avoid eating or drinking grapefruit. And lastly, it should be noted that some antibiotics are affected by statins. You know, an example of an antibiotic affected by statin would be erythromycin. Um, but your doctor will usually discontinue statins when you are on antibiotics that are affected by them. Next. Let's talk about anticoagulants. The most common anticoagulant used is warfarin. Now, the most common reason that a patient is put on warfarin is to prevent a heart attack or an a or or excuse me, or a stroke in a patient that has atrial fibrillation or person that has previously had a deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolus. Basically, they're trying to stop those from coming back as well. 
So what warfarin does is it prevents clots from forming in the bloodstream. So when you're on warfarin, you need to look for any signs of prolonged bleeding. Nosebleeds that last for more than a couple of minutes, severe, you know, bleeding gums, um, severe bruising, and always, always pay attention to your urine and your stools and note as to whether your urine is red or dark brown and note if your stools have any redness in them or if they appear to be black. If you're a woman, you may have heavier bleeding during your periods or other vaginal bleeding associated with warfarin. So please note, if you have any of these symptoms, you will need to immediately notify your healthcare provider. And if you have any prolonged bleeding, you're not able to get the bleeding to stop, immediately notify your emergency center that is near you. And yes, with warfarin, you will need frequent blood tests. Now this frequency will, depending, will depend on whether your warfarin is at a therapeutic level or not. Now, some things you need to know is when you're on warfarin, you should always carry your anticoagulant card with you. Second, always let any new person that is taking care of your health know that you're on an anticoagulant, you know, such as new doctors, dentists, etc. Third, always discuss with your pharmacist and doctor um, before taking any new medications. Warfarin is affected by um, quite a few medications. Fourth, avoid drinking cranberry juice. Fifth, avoid excessive amounts of alcohol as warfarin is affected by alcohol. And lastly, don't forget to keep any instructions your doctor has given you close by so that they could be referred to as needed. Okay, now we're going to talk about nitrates. Nitrates includes all forms of nitroglycerin, such as sprays, patches, gels, oral pills, and sublingual pills. In this section, I'm also going to address a medication called hydralazine, which is a vasodilator, but it's not a nitrate. So, nitrates are what are referred to as ba vasodilator. Basically, it means that they cause the veins to dilate by relaxing the muscles in the walls, which makes them a wider and allows more blood to flow through them. Now this has some great benefits from your heart for your heart. So nitrates are most frequently used in patients that have angina. A good thing about nitrates is that because of the way they work, they reduce the workload of the heart, which is one of the great things I was talking about. So what things should you tell your doctor about? Basically, if you have any of the following, you need to let your doctor know. Um, a throbbing headache, dizziness, flushing, fainting, or a rapid heartbeat. Now, sometimes nitrates are used with hydralazine, which is the medication that I mentioned before. Now, hydralazine is also a vasodilator, and like nitrates, it can lower your blood pressure and hydralazine also reduces the workload of the heart. Sometimes if you're unable to take ACE inhibitors, um, your doctor might use a combination of hydralazine and nitrates. Now, when you're taking hydralazine, you might experience one or more of its side effects, which includes headaches, rapid heart rate, rapid heart rate even, and may sometimes, it may sometimes cause fevers and some blood disorders. 
So if you have any unusual reaction to vasodilators in the past, you need to let your doctor know. One last thing. Viagra interacts with vi vasodilators. Now this can make your condition worse. Trust me. Um, this can make your heart condition worse, make your angina worse. So discuss with your doctor before taking Viagra. And okay, last medication of the series. And this is potassium. I know if you've been watching this series uh, that I've said don't take potassium after several medications, but I've always added the proviso unless prescribed. Well, potassium is an essential mineral in the body and too much or too little may cause serious arrhythmias. Now some of the medications you, you use may cause you to lose potassium such as diuretics um, and some medications may make your potassium higher. So what happens is the doctor will usually only prescribe potassium when it's needed to prevent your potassium from going too low. So the main side effects are pains in the stomach, diarrhea, vomiting. So all of these side effects should be reported to your doctor, especially if you have a new side effect of chest pain or, or throat pain. And yes, with this there will be blood checks starting before your potassium is prescribed and then on a regular basis. You should also avoid any salt substitutes as many of them have potassium and it may throw off your potassium levels. One final word about medications. Always take medications as prescribed and remember if you need help remembering when to take them a DOSA box might be might be helpful. Lastly, don't forget your healthcare providers are there for you, so don't be afraid to ask questions and always get clarity on anything you don't understand. Remember, be safe, be informed. All right. Our next discussion will be on how you can reduce your risk of further problems. Also, some of the things to look out for in the near future is part two of the cardiac re rehab series featuring Debbie Upchurch in an exercise program which can be performed at home by patients with heart failure. I know we had part one a long time ago, so we're going to have part two and we're going to continue on with that series. So this is Ray Upchurch. Be safe, be strong, love, th love those around you, and cherish each sunrise, and I will see you next time. See you then.